will be listening to a pre-recorded CD and the passages that you hear will increase in levels of difficulty as you go through the test. You will have to complete and answer each section before you move on to the next. In section 1, you will listen to a conversation between two people set in an everyday social situation. Each section is heard only once, so please listen carefully. Good afternoon, Dreamtime Travel. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm interested in the holidays you offer along the coast near here. Yes, we operate several tours up the coast. Where in particular did you want to go? Well, I like the sound of the holiday that mentioned whales. Was it um, whale watching? Oh, that's our whale watch experience. It's very popular and it's based in a lovely little town with nice beaches. Oh, right. And how long does it last? It's two days. That includes four hours travel time each way from here. Good. I don't want to be away any longer than that. So, is that by coach? Actually, it's by minibus. We like to keep those two as small and personal, so we don't take a whole coach load of people. In fact, we only take up to 15 people on this tour, although we do run it with just 12 or 13. Oh, right. So, do you run these tours often? Well, it depends on the time of year. Of course, in peak times, like the summer holidays, we do them every weekend. But at the moment, it's usually once a month at most. And when is the next one going? Hmm, let me see. Uh, there's one in three weeks' time, which is April the 18th. And then we don't have another one until uh, June the 2nd. All right. Um, and is April a good time to go? Pretty good, though the really good time is later in the year. I have to say, though, that the whale sighting is only one of the many things offered. Really? Yes. The hotel itself where you stay has great facilities. It's called the Palisades. Uh, the Paris what? No, it's actually the Palisades. P-A-L-L-I-S-A-D-E-S. It's right on the main beach there. Oh, I see. All of the rooms have nice views and the food is really good there too. Oh, right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. And what about the other things, um, you know, that are included in the price? Oh, there are lots of things. But if you don't want to do the Whale Watch cruise, your guide will take anyone who is interested either on a bushwalk through the National Park near the hotel, and there's no extra charge for that, or on a fishing trip. That's an extra $12, I think. And there's also a reptile park in town. That costs more or less the same. No, I think I'd prefer whales to snakes. Yeah. And if you just want to relax, you're free to sit by the hotel pool or go down the beach. Oh, and they also have tennis courts at the hotel, but you have to pay for those by the hour. But there are table tennis tables downstairs, and they're part of the accommodation package. Just speak to your guide. Well, that sounds good. Um, so how much is the basic tour price? At this time of year, it's usually around $300, but let me check. Um, oh, it's actually $280. And the next tour, are there any places on that one? How many people is it for? There are two of us. Yes, that should be fine. Can I just mention that we require all bookings to be made at least 14 days before you travel to avoid cancellations of tours? And if you cancel within seven days of departure, you will have to pay 50% of your total booking. OK. And you also need to pay a 20% deposit at the time of booking. Can I pay that by credit card? Yes, you can. All right. Uh, what I'll do is I'll talk to my partner and get back to you. Fine. 
So I'll make a provisional booking, shall I? Two for the whale watch experience. Let me issue you with a customer reference number for when you call back. Do you have a pen? Yes. Okay. It's three nine seven four five T. That's T for Tango. When you call back, ask to speak to the tour manager. That's me, Tracy. Fine, I will. In section two, you will listen to a monologue set in an everyday social situation. Each section is heard only once, so please listen carefully. And now for our main headlines on Southern local news for today. First of all, the report relating to the proposed motorway and other developments around the village of Tartlesbury was published this morning, and as has been expected, it has created quite a lot of interest. The new motorway will pass along the north side of the village, crossing the River Team less than half a kilometre from the well-known beauty spot Streve Ford. To the northeast of the village, the motorway will cut the village off from the ford, where many children play. But that is not the end of it. There are also plans to build a thousand houses on farmland west of the village, and on top of that, there are proposals to build an industrial estate for new technology companies on the site of the old steelworks on the edge of the village. A new centre with a swimming pool and a very wide range of sports facilities, and a large supermarket with other shops, are also planned next to the housing estate. Mr. Jones, a local farmer we spoke to early today, is strongly against the plans, but the local council is pushing for them to be adopted in full. They say that new housing is needed in the area, and that it is an opportunity to take advantage of government grants for setting up new technology developments. The mayor, Mr. Fun, says. We must make every effort to do our part for the economy of the country and for the local people. This is a golden opportunity to put Tartlesbury on the map. Reactions to Mr. Fun's comments have been quick to come. Surprisingly, when we contacted the spokesman of the local conservation group, he was very much for the planned developments, but not all the local groups support the scheme. And unlike the mayor, the local MP Mrs. Wright is very much against the planned developments. Mr. Khan, a local shopkeeper, had this to say: "People are absolutely horrified at what is being proposed here. This is just a chance for some people to make money quickly. But I can assure you that if they think that local people are going to be a walkover, they have another think coming. Of course." We welcome the jobs that the new technology park will bring, but we feel that the large increase in housing and the proposed motorway will destroy the character of the area. I think this is a debate that is going to run on for quite some time, and we here on local news will keep you informed. And now for something quite different. This year's exam results have just come out, and there are a lot of happy faces out there. It would seem that the number of young people going on to university from the local college in Upton, which is not far from Tartlesbury, has increased by twenty-five percent this year. All those who have applied to go to university or into teacher training colleges have found places. This is the first time that there has been a one hundred percent success rate at the college. We spoke earlier to the principal of the college, who said she was very proud of all those who had achieved their aims, and she wished them every success in the future. 
There will be another news bulletin at 11 p.m. And for now, it's back to more music from around the world. In section 3, you will listen to a conversation between up to four people set in an educational or training context. Each section is heard only once, so please listen carefully. Section 3. You will hear two business studies students, Jack and Sarah, talking to their tutor about a presentation they are preparing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, you two. Have a seat. <clears throat> OK. Um, so you're going to tell me about the presentation you're preparing for next week's marketing seminar, right? That's right. We've drafted this plan for you to look at. OK, thanks. Perhaps you could just talk me through it, could you? Uh, Sarah, do you want to begin? Yes. Uh, well, we're going to compare the websites of two bicycle companies. Right. And they're called Hills Cycles and Wheels Unlimited. Yes. And first of all, we've compared the content of each site and the presentation. Mm -hmm. Then we've done an evaluation of each one. OK. And did you find much difference between the two websites, Jack? Quite a bit, yes. Wheels Unlimited has a lot more pages for a start. Both companies show their catalogue. I mean, pictures of different models of bike with specifications. And prices? Yes, they're there too, although they list them in different ways. Hill Cycles have got them next to the pictures, and Wheels Unlimited show them on a separate page. But Wheels Unlimited advertises lots of other products connected with bikes, like helmets and clothing and tools. Yes, all kinds of things. And hill cycles? No, they only show the bikes themselves. OK. Well, is there anything on the hill cycles website that Wheels Unlimited doesn't have? Not really. Yes, there is. It's got a little photo of the original shop and a paragraph about the history of the company. It's family owned. Oh, yes. I forgot about that. Right. Uh, that's the content then. Mm. And you compared the functions of the two websites, did you? Yes. Hill Cycles doesn't have any facility for online ordering. You have to ring up to order something. That's the only way you can do it. Well, no. You can send off for a paper catalogue with an order form. Oh, yes, I suppose so. But with Wills Unlimited, you can order online or in the conventional ways. That's right. Fine. OK. And what about the presentation? Did you find any particular differences there or similarities? What about visuals? As I said, both the sites have got pictures and they're both quite attractive. But Wills Unlimited hasn't got any moving graphics. Yes. Hill Cycles has got an animated cartoon at the top of the home page. Right. Well, it looks as if you've got plenty to talk about. There are other things, too, but those are the main things we noticed. OK, well, you'd better stick to the most obvious differences, because you've only got ten minutes for the whole presentation, haven't you? Mm. And you said you're going to evaluate each site as well, didn't you? How are you going to do that? I mean, what criteria will you use? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. We thought we'd use three criteria. How attractive each website is, 
how user friendly it is, and how closely it targets its potential customers. Do you think that's okay? Sounds fine, but I'd look at the criteria in a different order if I were you, because really you've got to look at attractiveness and user friendliness in relation to the people the website is aiming at. So I'd deal with that criterion first if I were you. Right. What about the timing? Have you thought of that? Ten minutes is very short, you know. Yes, we tried it out <laughs> several times, and we've decided to spend four minutes comparing the two sites, then three minutes evaluating them, and leave three minutes for questions. That's not really enough, but well, it sounds about right to me. You've got ten minutes altogether, and you've got to stick to that limit. It's good practice. And at least the audience won't have time to get bored. <laughs> <laughs>、um, what visuals are you going to use? We're going to use PowerPoint and a flip chart as well. So we can show two things at once. For example, we're going to start by showing the home pages of each website, and we're going to put up a list of key features on the flip chart at the same time. Okay, and it's a joint presentation. So have you decided how you're going to share the work? Yes. First, we thought we'd keep taking it in turns to speak. Sarah would say a bit, then I take over, and so on. Then we thought we'd just divide it into two equal parts and do one part each, but it was all too complicated. So Sarah's going to do all the talking, and I'm going to manage the visuals, and hope we can coordinate properly. It's the only way we can fit everything in. Well, good. You've obviously worked hard, and you've been very careful with the details. Only one thing I would say: make sure that you keep your visuals simple. I mean, if you're showing a list of key features, for example, you should make it as brief as possible. Just use bullet points and simple phrases, even single words. Your audience won't have much reading time. It's a classic mistake with seminar presentations to present so much information that the audience can't process it quickly enough, and they stop listening to what you're saying. Okay? Yes.、Mm. Right. Okay. And now let's talk about something. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. In section four, you will listen to a monologue on an academic subject. Each section is heard only once, so please listen carefully. Now turn to section four. Okay, so we've been looking at the attitudes of various social and cultural groups towards the management of their personal finances, how important they feel it is to save money. And what they save their money for. One aspect that we haven't yet considered is gender. So, if we consider gender issues, we're basically asking whether men and women have different attitudes towards saving money, and whether they save money for different things. Back in 1928, the British writer George Bernard Shaw wrote in his *Intelligent Women's Guide to Socialism and Capitalism* that a man is supposed to understand politics, economics, and finance. And is therefore unwilling to accept essential instruction. He also said, "A woman, having fewer pretensions, is far more willing to learn." Now, though these days people might question a lot of the assumptions contained in those statements, recent research does suggest that there are some quite fundamental differences between men and women in their attitudes to economic matters. Let's look at what men and women actually save for. Research studies of women in North America have found that women are far more likely to save for their children's education, and they are also more likely to save up in order to buy a house one day. The same studies have found that men, on the other hand, tend to save for a car, which, by the way, takes a surprisingly large amount of the household budget in North America. But the other main priority for men when saving money is their retirement. 
When they're earning, they're far more likely to put money aside for their old age than women are. Now, this is rather disturbing, because, in fact, the need for women to save for their old age is far greater than for men. Let's consider this for a moment. To start with, it is a fact that throughout the world, women are likely to live many years longer than men, so they need money to support them during this time. Since women are likely to be the ones left without a partner in old age, they may therefore have to pay for nursing care because they don't have a spouse to look after them. Furthermore, the high divorce rates in North America are creating a poverty cycle for women. It is the divorced women who will most often have to look after the children and thus they need more money to look after not just themselves but others. So what can be done about this situation? The population in North America is likely to contain an increasing number of elderly women. The research indicates that at present for women it takes a crisis to make them think about their future financial situation. But of course this is the very worst time for anyone to make important decisions. Women today need to look ahead, think ahead, not wait until they're under pressure. Even women in their early twenties need to think about pensions, for example, and with increasing numbers of women in professional positions, there are signs that this is beginning to happen. Then research also suggests that women avoid dealing effectively with their economic situation because of a lack of confidence. The best way for them to overcome this is by getting themselves properly informed so they are less dependent on other people's advice. A number of initiatives have been set up to help them do this. This college, for example, is one of the educational institutions which offers night classes in money management, and increasing numbers of women are enrolling on such courses. Here, they can be given advice on different ways of saving. Many women are unwilling to invest in stocks and shares, for instance, but these can be extremely profitable. It is usually advised that at least 70% of a person's savings should be in low-risk investments, but for the rest, financial advisors often advise taking some well-informed risks. Initiatives such as this can give women the economic skills and knowledge they need for a comfortable, independent retirement. The increasing proportion of elderly women in the population is likely to have other economic consequences.